Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to begin our presentation. I'm going to ask you for, because this is being recorded for playback purposes, if you could please turn your cells on vibrate or turn them off so as not to interrupt the presentations. We're going to give you some instructions on questions toward the end of the presentation. Okay? Thank you. Human rights is, um, geez, that's a good question. Human rights. Well, that's a tough one. Wow. Um, I don't even know how to give that a definition. I would probably have to do a little bit of homework or something. Yeah, any right that I think any, just as a normal, you know, uh, human, any... The rights that humans have? Uh, oh, that's a very large debate. I don't know how to ask 20 people and they will give you 20 different opinions. I don't know how to We just take them for granted that they're there, but we don't even consider what they are. Human rights are the rights you have simply because you're human. It's how you instinctively expect and deserve to be treated as a person, like the right to live freely, to speak your mind, and to be treated as an equal. There are many kinds of rights. Most apply to a certain group. But human rights are the only ones that apply to absolutely everyone, everywhere. That means kids, old people, poor people, basketball players, garbage men, rappers, teachers, Africans, Indians, Albanians, Christians, Muslims, Kabbalists, atheists, your mom, your dad, your next door neighbor, and you all have the exact same human rights. In other words, they're universal. But the question remains, what are they? Name human, the human rights? What the human rights are? Um... The right to live. Um, Equality between all peoples. Right to religion, the right to... Is there supposed to be a list somewhere I should be aware of? According to the United Nations, there are a total of 30 human rights, which are usually lumped together and called simply human rights. They're all listed out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the world's most widely accepted document on the subject. But it was a long time in coming. At first, there were no human rights. If you were in with the right crowd, you were safe. If you weren't, well, you weren't. But then a guy named Cyrus the Great decided to change all that. After conquering Babylon, he did something completely revolutionary. He announced that all slaves were free to go. He also said people had the freedom to choose their religion, no matter what crowd they were a part of. They documented his words on a clay tablet known as the Cyrus Cylinder. And just like that, human rights were born. The idea spread quickly to Greece, to India, and eventually to Rome. They noticed that people naturally followed certain laws, even if they weren't told to. They called this natural law, but it kept getting trampled on by those in power. Not until a thousand years later in England did they finally get a king to agree that no one can overrule the rights of the people, not even a king. People's rights were finally recognized, and they were now safe from those in power. Kind of. It still took a bunch of British rebels declaring their independence before the king got the point that all men are created equal. Which isn't to say he liked the idea, but he couldn't stop them, and America was born. The French immediately followed with their own revolution for their own rights. Their list was even longer, and they insisted that these rights weren't just made up. They were natural. The Roman concept of natural law had become natural rights. Unfortunately, not everyone was so thrilled. In France, a general named Napoleon decided to overthrow the new French democracy and crown himself emperor of the world. He almost succeeded. But the countries of Europe joined forces and defeated him. Human rights was again a hot topic. They drew up international agreements, broadly granting many rights across Europe. But only across Europe. The rest of the world somehow still didn't qualify. Instead, they got invaded, conquered, and consumed by Europe's massive empires. But 
But then a young lawyer from India decided enough was enough. His name was Mahatma Gandhi, and in the face of violence, he insisted that all people of Earth had rights, not just in Europe. Eventually, even Europeans started to agree. But it wasn't going to be that easy. Two world wars erupted. Hitler exterminated half the Jewish population of Earth in horrifying Nazi death camps. And all told, 90 million people died. Never had human rights been so terrifyingly close to extinction. And never had the world been more desperate for change. So the countries of Earth banded together and formed the United Nations. Their basic purpose was to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person. But what were human rights? Were they the proclamations of Cyrus, the natural laws of Rome, the declarations of France? Everyone seemed to have a slightly different idea of what human rights should be. But under the supervision of Eleanor Roosevelt, they finally agreed on a set of rights that apply to absolutely everyone. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The French concept of natural rights had finally become human rights. So in summary, at first, only a few lucky people had any rights until one of those guys decided, hey, other people should have some rights too, which was great, except not everyone agreed. And it only took a few thousand years of fighting and declarations and more fighting until everyone finally agreed that human rights should apply to everyone. And they all lived happily ever after. Except for one little problem. If people have the right to food and shelter, why are 16,000 children dying of starvation every day? One every five seconds. If people have freedom of speech, why are thousands in prison for speaking their minds? If people have the right to education, why are over a billion adults unable to read? If slavery has truly been abolished, why are 27 million people still enslaved today? More than twice as many as in 1800. The fact is, when it was signed, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did not have the force of law. It was optional. And despite many more documents, conventions, treaties, and laws, it's still little more than words on a page. So the question is, who will make those words a reality? I have a dream today. When Dr. King marched for racial equality, he was marching for rights that had been guaranteed by the United Nations for almost two decades. But still, he marched. When Nelson Mandela stood up for social justice in the 1990s, his country had already agreed to abolish such discrimination for almost 40 years. But still, he fought. Those who fight today against torture, poverty, and discrimination are not giants or superheroes. They're people, kids, mothers, fathers, teachers, free-thinking individuals who refuse to be silent who realize that human rights are not a history lesson. They're not words on a page. They're not speeches or commercials or PR campaigns. They are the choices we make every day as human beings. They are the responsibility we all share to respect each other, to help each other, and to protect those in need. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? in small places close to home. So close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere.
Good evening and welcome to the Law and You program. I'm Erica Sidberry with the Wilmington Police Department. I've been with the police department for almost two years now. I'm currently assigned to the Northwest Patrol Division. We have a great program for you and hope you not only learn something, but also consider the information that you will be provided as a viable tool. We would like to first thank our sponsors and they are the Wilmington Police Department, New Hanover County Sheriff's Office, District Attorney's Office, the NAACP, Noble, Allstate Insurance, the OOPS Foundation, New Hanover County Schools, UNCW, and certainly, last but not least, our community volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And my name is Chris Pinkett. I'm originally from New York. I spent half my life in Jamaica, Queens, in the Indian Reservation. I did security investigative work. I worked with ATF on cigarette traffic and other law agencies. I moved down to Wilmington about 10 years ago. And uh, I'm here because I want to make a difference. At the end of the day, I want everybody to go home safe. The Law and You, a citywide initiative to teach you about human rights and your rights when being stopped by a law enforcement officer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is Yolanda Sparrow, and I've been serving the citizens of Wilmington for 29 years now. And um, during this presentation, we will review the following. If you are stopped on the street, if you are stopped in your car, if a law enforcement officer comes to your door, if you are arrested, how to file a complaint, and how you can help develop better police community relations. So at this time, I would like to let you know that we have note cards. And if you would please use the note cards to write your questions on and hold your questions until after the presentation and we will address any questions that you have at the end of our presentation. Thank you so kindly. Next case, the People versus Martin White. Mr. White has been charged with- Guilty, next case. But Geronic, you, you haven't heard the charges yet. I think we can all agree that wasn't uh, a judge that any of us would want to appear in front of. Um, my name is Tom Old. I work for the district attorney's office and have since 2006. Prior to that, I spent 19 years as a judge in Ohio and another 14 as a private lawyer. So I've seen the law from all sides. And I want to assure you that our office's obligation is to do justice and not just prosecute people. That's one of the reasons I'm here. The Fourth Amendment originally enforced the notion that each man's home is his castle, secure from unreasonable searches and seizures of property by the government. The word I want to emphasize tonight is free from unreasonable searches and seizures, because the Fourth Amendment does not prohibit all searches. Law enforcement are required to have probable cause for searches. They're required to have reasonable suspicion in order to stop people. And they, they're required to have probable cause for arrests. Search warrants are much the same. An officer has to obtain a search warrant from a judge, and to that judge, he must show that there is probable cause to believe that the law is being violated uh, in the, the place where the search warrant is issued. Stop and frisk is another technical term. Terry versus Ohio, years and years ago, allowed officers to stop and frisk people on the street where they had a reasonable suspicion and a reasonable concern for their safety, where they believed people might have weapons that would endanger them. Uh, they are entitled to do that. 
Wiretaps and other forms of surveillance generally require search warrants as well. Those are reviewed by judges. One thing I, I want to emphasize here, and it's something that I have seen over all of my 40 years, if there is one piece of advice that I would offer to people, and particularly young people, if you want to offer the police the keys to your kingdom, the kingdom of your car, or the kingdom of your house, smoke weed there. Because when an officer approaches your car, if he smells marijuana, that's probable cause to search your vehicle. He doesn't need a search warrant, doesn't need anything more. If you open the door to your house, and you can smell marijuana in your house, that's probable cause for a search. The officers don't have to go back and get a search warrant. That is, in fact, probable cause. Marijuana is illegal in this state. But moreover, if, if you don't want your house or your car searched, one of the most valuable pieces of advice I can offer you is don't smoke marijuana there. That's, that's the perfect opportunity for an officer to search beyond anything else. That's what I've seen over, over the period of my career. The Fifth Amendment uh, creates a number of rights relevant to both criminal and civil legal proceedings. In criminal cases, first of all, a grand jury is required in order to find probable cause to indict someone and have them face felony charges. Secondly, it forbids double jeopardy, which means that the state can't try you over and over and over again until they're able to convict. They're, they're entitled to one shot. When a jury's impaneled, if the state is unsuccessful in proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt, you can't be tried again, which is only as it should be. It also pro protects against self-incrimination. And under the Fifth Amendment, you are not required to admit to anything. You're not even required to speak to the police, although under some circumstances it may be a wise choice. If you've done nothing wrong, if, if you're in a situation where you know you've done nothing wrong, sometimes it's wise to, to talk civilly. The other piece of advice I guess I would offer is this. The problems that I have seen for criminal defendants, both young and old, over the years, I've often said to myself, particularly as a judge, why did he do that? In your initial encounter with a law enforcement officer, they're required to be polite. But so should you. Oftentimes, a polite conversation between law enforcement and someone who has an encounter with a law enforcement officer can end civilly and pretty well if both parties will simply talk to one another in a civil manner and see where the situation lies. Usually those things take the wrong turn where people start to argue with one another. Finally, as an aside, the Fifth Amendment also requires that the state can't take private property for public use without due process of law. Uh, those are the, the, the basic tenets of the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. I can tell you that they provide you with wide protections and that the, that the courts enforce those protections. Judges are required and take an oath to make sure that your constitutional rights are not violated. And in, almost without exception, except perhaps with the example that played just before I walked up here, uh, that occurs in this country. That's what the Constitution requires, and that's what, what normally will happen. Finally, I will say to you that the Fifth Amendment also requires that you not be held unlawfully. Bail is something that everyone hears about and no one really understands. Bail has two purposes. The primary purpose of bail is to ensure that an accused appears in court when he or she has been charged and is required to be there. In North Carolina and in most states, there is also an additional provision of bail where if under unusual circumstances, a judge finds that the accused is a danger to himself or to others, a real danger, not a perceived danger, 
then bail can be much higher than it might be just in order to assure that someone appears. And those are the provisions of the Fourth and Fifth Amendment that I can explain to you right now. My name is Alex Walton. I've been a deputy with the Sheriff's Office just about a little over two years, but I've been working with the Sheriff's Office for six years. It'll be six years next month. I worked in the jail for over my first five years. I've been with the Crime Awareness and Prevention Unit for about the last nine months, known as the CAP Unit under Sergeant Pope. My name is Jeff Pope. Currently, I'm a sergeant um, at the Sheriff's Office. Been working about 16 years at the Sheriff's Office. Currently, I'm assigned <coughs> to the CAP Unit, um, Crime Awareness and Prevention. Just some things to keep in mind. If you're stopped on the street for questioning, you need to first and foremost stay calm. Do not badmouth or walk away. Currently, North Carolina does not have a stop and identify law, which means, I'm going to use Deputy Walton as an example. If I'm walking down the street, and so is Deputy Walton, if I approach him, sir, can I talk to you? What do you want to talk to me about? I just want to um, get some information for you, your ID. Just want to talk to you. Am I being detained? No, sir, you're not. I just want to talk to you. Nah, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm just going to walk away. He's free to walk away. Okay. Ask if you are free to leave, kind of going over what we just kind of give you an example of there. Make sure you lay out clearly if you are, in fact, wanting to leave the situation, if you lawfully can. You can choose to remain silent. You do not have to consent to a search. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I was ready to explode. This was like the fourth time this year I've been pulled over for nothing. <sighs> License and registration? Yeah, I know the drill, man. Excuse me? License? Registration. No need for the attitude there, bro. I'm looking out for your safety and everyone else's on this road. <laughs> Whatever, man. Okay, step out of the vehicle for me. Turn around What's and up, put man? your hands in the air. Turn around and put your hands in the air. Gosh, man. Walk forward, walk forward. Hands on the hood. Hands on the hood me? of the car. Do it. Damn, damn. Spread your legs. What are you doing, man? Relax. God damn. I didn't do anything. Relax. God, I didn't do anything. You got a bad attitude. Now, I pulled you over because you were swerving between lanes. That's all. Now, you got a choice here. If you cooperate, you're going to make things a whole lot easier on yourself. Now, what that means is you got to be straight with me. You understand? Yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Atiba Johnson. I'm the executive director of the OOPS Foundation, local nonprofit working with youth ages 16 to 21 in Pender and New Hanover counties. We do job development, employability skills, uh, different types of trainings. So what we just saw is if you were stopped in your car, we gonna do the video first. We'll just do the video here. Okay, we're going to talk about the video first. I think that's what she whispered. In reference to the video, uh, a couple of things happened there that we hope would not happen when you're stopped. One is the driver was agitated for being stopped. And two is the officer got agitated to the fact that the driver was agitated. I have an 18-year-old son, and I'm going to describe him to you. And then I'm going to describe for you the instructions that I gave my son and I would advise you to take that advice. I'm almost a 30-year veteran, and I'm a mama. My son is 18. He's 6'6", and he's over 300 pounds. He just started driving. These are my instructions for my son. If you are stopped by the police, keep your hands on the steering wheel, son. If you're asked to get out of the car, get out slowly, because once he get out, the officer might ask him to get back in because he's going to have to look up at him to talk to him. And if you're asked for your driver's license and, and your registration, anything in the glove box, let the officer know 
My license is in my back pocket. My registration is in my glove box. Don't make any sudden moves because I don't want my son ending up in a situation like this. Thank you. So as we saw in the video, the first thing you should do is stop the car in a safe place as quickly as possible. With that being said, make sure it's a safe place, well-lit area where you feel comfortable and safe. That does not mean ride 30, 45 minutes riding around town in a circle giving the police a joy ride. Please stop in a well-lit, safe place and pull over immediately. The instructions I gave my son, stay in the driver's seat with both hands on the steering wheel. And that is extremely important for the safety of the operator and for the safety of the officer. Don't make any sudden moves. Upon request, show police your driver's license and registration. Again, just to harp on what Officer Sparrow said, make sure you notify the police when you're reaching to your glove compartment. Don't just suddenly reach to your glove compartment. Make sure you take your time. My registration is in my glove compartment or my license is in my wallet. I need to get it. Is it okay for me to get it? And proceed that way. If the officer asks to look inside your car, you can refuse the consent to search. You have the right to say no. If you are placed under arrest, there are times when an officer uh, may be able to search your vehicle. And that is times um, like uh, retired Judge Old said, if the officer stop your car and you put your window down and there's an odor of marijuana coming from your car, then the consent to search is not required um, because of those circumstances. And there are also other circumstances in reference to incident to arrest. Both the driver and passengers have the right to remain silent. You do not have to answer any questions to the officer, but that doesn't mean be disrespectful. If you are suspected of drinking and driving, cooperate with the law enforcement officer. There are other circumstances. If you do not cooperate, you do not have to submit to um, the breathalyzer, but there are other circumstances in North Carolina that you will lose your driver's license um, for a longer period of time if you do not consent. So there are other things that can take place. So we do ask you to cooperate with the officer. Educational moment for myself as well as some of my youth. Officers should provide a specific reason for the stop, but I learned today that they do not have to tell you why they're stopping you. It's just proper etiquette that they do, but it's, it's not required of them to tell you why you're being stopped. So just a heads up for my youth as well as some of my other young folks and adults as well, because I had to learn that today as well. So they do not have to tell you why you're being stopped. It's just proper etiquette. Thank you. My name is Patricia Combs and I'm a senior at UNCW, currently in the social work department. I am interning at the Wilmington Police Department and I'm also a recovering drug addict. And in my past, when I was still abusing drugs, I had several years of run-ins with both law enforcement agencies in New Hanover County. And I can honestly tell you that I've never had a bad experience with any law enforcement agency in New Hanover County. And they also were instrumental in getting me clean and sober today. And good evening, my name is Leslie Irving. I'm a corporal with the Wilmington Police Department. Been at uh, the police department for 15 and a half years. Currently I'm in the position of the Crime Prevention Unit. This evening on this portion of the presentation, we're going to be discussing if the police come to your home. Uh, make sure the individual is really a law enforcement agent a law enforcement officer, you can ask for them to produce a badge if they're not in uniform. And if the officers are searching your home with a search warrant, you should be given a copy of that search warrant. Even if the officer has a warrant, you have the right to remain silent. And just also keep in mind, if you guys, or if you know that you may have a warrant for your arrest, try to take care of that ahead of time. Call your local law enforcement agency, try to get that warrant served on you prior to that. That is easier on us as well as safer on you to, uh, so you would not have a boy for us come to your home. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. I'm Officer Maddox with the Wilmington Police Department. I'm currently assigned to the Northwest Patrol Division just as a patrol officer. And uh, myself and Corporal Melville will be presenting to you guys about if the incident occurs where you actually are placed under arrest. Uh, the first uh, recommendation we have is if you are, or first bit of information we have for you is if you are taken into custody, you will have the opportunity to make sure that your house or your vehicle is secure before you're taken away. Do not resist arrest if you believe the arrest is unfair. Uh, it's not a place to take care of it. That's why we have the court system, so wait till a later time. We'll take care of that if you think something's been unfair. One of the basic rights you do have is you have the choice to either speak to the police, remain silent, and or have the opportunity to speak to a lawyer. You do have a right to make phone calls. Um, when you get to the jail, you'll definitely be allowed to make a phone call. Sometimes, if it's able to, we'll let you do it at the Wilmington Police Department. It just depends on the circumstances and your attitude and interactions. If you happen to know that you are going to be placed under arrest, uh, it is recommended that you go ahead and prepare yourself by making contact with work or family or any other person that you need to notify of the situation. And all arrests do not require Miranda rights, even though a lot of people think they do. If you're not being interrogated and you're not in custody, you do not have to be given your Miranda rights. Good evening. I'm Dave Spencer. I've been with the New Hanover County Schools for well over 30 years. I was at, uh, at Hoggard, New Hanover, and Hoggard, and, and now I'm currently with the central office. Now, let's just suppose that you are involved with the law enforcement agencies and things aren't going the way that you feel like they should go. And you feel like, okay, that I need to take this to another step, to another level, and I'd like to file a complaint. There are a few ways that you can do this. One of the ways is going to be by a phone call. Now, that just kind of gets the ball rolling. That's not an official stance as far as making an official complaint, but that does give you the opportunity to, to receive the instructions, and you'll be provided step-by-step -step instructions in order to file a complaint. Complaints are taken very seriously, and so it is a very serious part on, on you taking that stand as well as the law enforcement agencies taking the stand to investigate those responses and those complaints. So a phone call can kind of start the ball rolling. And again, at that, that time, the, both agencies, the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office as well as the Wilmington Police Department would be able to take you through the next steps um, as need be or if need be. Another way is you can simply go to the agency yourself and report it face to face. Again, it's something that's, very, that's taken very seriously and um, the, the opportunity for a face to face as well as getting a signature so that folks know who is making the complaints as well as the reasons behind the complaint. And then uh, the final way is you can go on, online and uh, the addresses are listed up here on the, on the slide and go online and again, that sort of starts the ball rolling Again, with making things an official complaint, um, because they, and we we want to. There's an attempt to make things as easy as possible, but at the same time, there's got to be accountability. You're expecting accountability on the part of the law enforcement agencies, and the law enforcement agencies are expecting accountability on the person with the complaint as well. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Deborah Dix Maxwell, President of Hanover County NAACP, District Director for Bladen, Brunswick, Columbus, Onslow, Pender counties, and New Hanover. My section is use of force, the law and you. Part of that is determined by what's in North Carolina General Statutes 15A-401, which says use of force and arrest. A law enforcement officer is justified in using force to another person to the extent that he reasonably believes is necessary to prevent that person from escaping and to defend himself from that person or a third person. Use of force section two, a law enforcement officer is justified in using deadly force upon another person for the purpose specified in subdivision one only when it appears to be reasonably necessary thereby to defend himself or a third person for what he reasonably believes to be 
the use of force or deadly physical force to effect an arrest or to prevent the escape from custody of a person who he reasonably believes is attempting to escape by means of a deadly weapon, to prevent the escape of a person from custody imposed upon him as a result of the conviction for a felony. It's very important that we understand these definitions as they've been the realm of why we're here and a lot of things that have occurred not only in this community but across this country. So it's not only for law enforcement to read it again, but also the citizens to understand. And next we have how use of force cases are resolved within the Wilmington Police Department. I realize the Sheriff's Department is here, but we don't, this is for the Wilmington Police Department. All use of force reports are reviewed by the supervisor and the internal affairs of the unit. Serious allegations, which they will define to you what serious is, are investigated by the Internal Affairs Unit. Less serious allegations are reviewed by the supervisor. Incidents of potential criminal nature are sent to the District Attorney's Office and the State Bureau of Investigation. It is at that time when it goes to the District Attorney's Office, something may be sent to the grand jury, as you have noted, if you've been keeping track of events within the city, which then they make the determination whether it will be founded or accepted. I'm not a lawyer, so a lawyer would have to give you the correct terminology for that. Mr. Oles will do that. But that is the process in which things occur at this time in Wilmington and New Hanover County. Also, for those of you who are not law enforcement, we also have them for those who are. We requested these from the NAACP legal department, the law and you. And it's just a pocket guide which rehashes everything which we said for you to take home with you. And Ms. Roberta will have those. She's a pretty lady over there with a magenta scarf for you after this. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody has rights. And so tonight's presentation was so that you would know some of the basic rights that you all have. At this time, we're going to ask you to write down any questions you may have. There was a lot of information that we went over earlier. Some of you were not here for the entire presentation. But we realize we can't answer every question, but we're going to try to address as many of those as possible. So if you would take a moment now, if you need a pen or a note card, to jot down any questions you may have, we have some volunteers, if you'll stand volunteers, who are willing to collect your questions for us. We're going to ask for Tom to come forward. We've got some representatives from the Sheriff's Department, uh, Lieutenant Sparrow, uh, we also want, I think there are some other officers I asked, if you'd come stand, and as the questions are written and collected, uh, we're going to try and address those as best as possible for you so that you can get as much information as possible. I do want to talk just briefly about the video of the traffic stop. And for those of you who saw it, you probably noticed not only did the officer, the, the, the driver have an attitude, but the officer had an attitude. But you also saw that the young man was being handcuffed. And so I want to talk, um, have someone to talk just a little bit about the difference in being detained and being arrested. I want to ask Lieutenant Sparrow to address it. In the video, when the officer asked him to get out of the car and he placed him on the hood and then um, put the handcuffs on him, in our line of work, that is called a detainment. And we normally do that to stop all action. When things are appearing to go awry, we will detain someone, stop all action, stop all movement until we can regain control. And from that point, an arrest can occur by telling the person, you are under arrest. Um, in the real world, we would have told the person, you're being detained until I can get control of the situation or until I can get another unit here. Or if the person was under arrest, they would have been told, you're being placed under arrest. Okay. Tom? There's, there's one other thing I'd like to say. I, I like to think that as a lawyer and as a member of the district attorney's office, we stand in a sense in between the public and law enforcement. 
we obviously prosecute cases on behalf of the police, but we also have a duty to do justice. But the one observation I want to make to you, because I have had friends who have had occasions to have uh, contact with law enforcement under bad circumstances and know many law enforcement officers. I think the one thing that's overlooked in this whole situation is this. When a law enforcement officer stops a vehicle, whether the, the occupant is white, black, yellow, whether it's a Cadillac Escalade or, or a, a broken down car, whether it's at night or in daytime, there is a reasonable apprehension of a law enforcement officer who is walking up to a vehicle. They don't know who's in the vehicle. They don't know what's in the vehicle. They don't know what could happen as a result of the person who is in the vehicle. I would venture to say that, that more than half of the deaths of law enforcement officers occur in traffic stops when they approach a vehicle and they're shot. So it's reasonable for them to be concerned. It's also reasonable for a person who's stopped by a law enforcement officer. I won't tell you that I've never been pulled over by a law enforcement officer. And I also won't tell you that when I saw the blue lights in my back window, I wasn't nervous as hell. I think we all are. It's just a natural reaction. You say, oh my gosh, the police are stopping me. It's from that point forward that things can go badly. It's from that point forward, if the officer doesn't op operate with restraint, and if the person in the vehicle isn't restrained and polite and concerned, that things can go badly. But I do want to tell you that I think it's fair for you to understand that just because a law enforcement officer has a gun and a badge, they aren't concerned when they walk up to the window of a vehicle. They have to be because they want to go home at night just like you do. They don't really want to be one of those persons who ends up shot on the side of the road and a vehicle drives off. So understand their situation. They're trying to be careful. They all, you are also entitled to their courtesy. You're entitled for them to act lawfully, but understand their situation as well. It's, it's a dangerous situation for everyone. Where there are guns and vehicles and people involved, it's always dangerous. We hope that everyone will act with restraint and everyone can go home safely. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and get to our questions. Um, the first question I have uh, is from uh, the perspective of an individual who has been arrested and who is a felon. And it says, at what point does an individual convicted of a felony become a citizen again? In other words, um, when, do they, when are they not treated as if they're under arrest or if they are a felon or if they're guilty of something? And I want to pose that to a law enforcement person. The, a conviction for a felony doesn't mean that someone's guilty of something else. It's not proof that because someone was convicted of a felony five years ago, they are necessarily guilty of anything today. It, however, would be a concern to an officer who pulled over a vehicle, and if they, they're told that the driver of that vehicle was convicted of a violent felony, they're concerned. But it doesn't mean to the court system that that person is guilty of the new offense. There are also provisions in North Carolina law where convictions can be expunged under certain circumstances. We've done a lot of work through our office um, and had clinics, and there will be more, where we've had law students and, and uh, professors come from, from colleges to help people expunge those convictions that can be so that their rights can, in fact, be restored. Uh, so once you're convicted of a serious felony, of some serious felonies, they never go away. So it's, it's best not to get one to begin with, I guess. It's safe to say. Um, 
Also, another note is that once you've completed your probation and parole, whether it's a felony or not, you are also able to vote again within this state. And there is a current expungement clinic that is being offered with OOPS and another group that's going on shortly, right, Mr. Johnson? So there is one locally going on at this time. I guess I want to, because I want to make sure that we address this properly. Um, and, I, and I know where this is actually coming from, the fact that sometimes people have records and law enforcement are familiar with their pasts. And so they have a tendency to get stopped more. Uh, they have a tendency to get pulled over more. And they have a tendency to get questioned more. And so the frustration is, when will this stop for me? And so uh, I wanted to just make that point because there are individuals in our community who are known by law enforcement. They're known, their past are known, but it doesn't necessarily make it right that they are always stopped, especially if there is no reason to stop them. So I understand where this question is coming from, and I believe that it is important that as law enforcement, we must always make sure that whatever we do is fair and equal to everybody. Re you know, and so I really, I understand where the question is coming from. The next question that's coming is, why are two or more individuals of color viewed as a gang quicker than individuals of another race? And want to pose that question. I know we have Deputy Chief Cunningham in the back who's over our gang unit. Um, but I guess we need to talk about how we classify gangs and why are perhaps two African-American males together viewed as being in a gang, if that's the, if that's the case. No, of course not. Um, basically, gang validation process involves a certain series of indicators, typically behaviors. Sometimes it involves, um, uh, for example, gang dress, gang signs. Um, it, we, uh, one of the key factors in validating a gang member is if we have a person who self-admits. Sometimes people, if you ask a person, are they a member of a gang? Sadly, they're actually proud of it in some cases. So that will be sufficient to validate that person as a gang member. In other cases, if we have a person who's a reliable informant, a person who we, who we know over time has given us consistent, reliable information, and they give us information, that will be one of the indicators that we will use. Um, Around the country, there is a kind of a growing consensus about how to validate gang members. It's typically two indicators. The Wilmington Police Department has decided to actually uh, only validate a gang member if there are three indicators. We want to take that extra step. So we're looking for behaviors, validate, um, I should say credible information in determining who's a gang member. Okay, the next question. In Wilmington, when African Americans are stopped, the first questions are, where are you going and where have you been? Why is this so? Are such questions appropriate, even if only a small number of officers initiate the encounter with these questions? Is this an appropriate question? I'll answer that. If the circumstances are in a suspicious nature, those are general questions that an officer will ask in a stop, whether it's a stop of an individual on the street or stopping them in the car. Those are generic questions. Um, where are you going or where have you been? And it just determines the circumstances. If the officers work in that area where something has happened, if a, uh, a vehicle matches a description and they stop the vehicle, if a person walking matches the description, they ask that question. It's a general question to gain information. A lot of times as police officers, um, we work off of what we call a hunch. Um, and we work our cases from that. And you all have had it. I just had a thought or I had a hunch. And if you come into contact with someone, you ask those general questions. May I ask where you're coming from? You don't have to answer. And may I ask where you're going? And you don't have to answer. 
but that is our job. And those are general questions that's asked by law enforcement officers around the country. Thank you. Next question is, is there a document law enforcement guide to interacting with citizens? And so um, I can only imagine because this training is to help citizens interact with police, is there an interaction for law enforcement to learn how to interact with citizens? Uh, there is a state mandated training that all police officers, I believe sheriff's deputies go through it as well, called the minority, juvenile minority sensitivity training. It is mandated by law and it covers community relations, interacting with diverse groups of people, and it covers an abundance of interactive uh, programs for law enforcement and the general public. The police department and other agencies within this region are looking at more community relations training, and we're actually partnering on doing that and hoping to be able to do that soon. The NAACP is working with us as well to make sure that kind of training happens and not only make it so law enforcement are there, but also make sure that community members are involved when that training happens. The next question. Okay, I'm trying to understand some of these handwritings, y'all. If I'm innocent, this is for the DA dude. If I'm innocent until proven guilty, why must I bond out until I can prove my case? Feels like I'm guilty until proven innocent. Well, you must bond out because before you can be put under bond, you have to be brought, by, brought before a magistrate who has to review the facts that are given by the officer and that officer has to show the magistrate that there is probable cause to believe that you have committed the offense with which you've been charged. That's the, one of the duties of a magistrate is to review and make sure that there are in fact probable cause before you can be placed under arrest and placed under bond. That includes whether, it, whether it's a, an officer who brings you in or what, what is sort of foreign to me but occurs to North Carolina and that's what's called a self-initiated warrant where a person can walk in off the street to a magistrate and give them facts and ask that a warrant be issued for someone. But the fact is that bond is, is, is required in order, but it can't be required until there's probable cause shown for the arrest. Next question, what happens when an officer does not allow you to walk away? What rights do you have then? That's where the complaint process comes in. That's where you make a complaint to the, uh, to the department for which that officer works. Now, there may be reasons why an officer would not let you walk away, but, but those are circumstances of or more special circumstances that are required. But in an ordinary encounter, just like uh, Deputy Pope and, and his partner here talked about, uh, if that officer doesn't let you walk away, you have a right to make a complaint. Next question for the Sheriff's Department. If an officer stops me on the street, or in my case, asks me a question, at what point do I have the right to remain silent, and how can I refuse to talk in a way that will not be viewed as offensive to the officer? Please give some examples. Well, if the deputy or the officer aren't detaining the person, they're free to walk away. The only thing we ask to be respectful, we can be respectful for you, respectful for us. Pretty simple. All you have to do is say, am, am I free to go? And, and I choose not to, not to talk to you. You don't say, it, am I free to go? Am I going to, you know. It, it, politeness and courtesy goes so far between human beings. And, and the lack of it just ignites problems for everyone. If, if a person simply says, sir, am I free to go? Am I being detained? And if the officer says, I'd still like to speak to you, say, you know, I prefer not to speak to you. I have those rights, and I'd like to leave. That, it's, it's simple enough. There's no answer that the officer can give you other than have a nice day. And so once you're stopped and the officer doesn't make it easy for you to leave, 
Can you pull out your cell phone and videotape the encounter? Sure. Okay. There's no problem with me videotaping my stop. No. Okay. See if you can see what this is. What is the statute of limitations on the laws of a sheet? Oh, you've asked a question. I don't know the answer to that. I bet no one in this room does. Does anyone know the answer? Statue of limitations on the laws of what is it? Escheat. Escheat. Okay, we don't have the answer to that, but we'll get it for you. Okay? All right. The question to the DA dude again. Do you prosecute cases on behalf of the police or on behalf of the citizens? Well, thanks for calling me a dude. I kind of like that. Um, the district attorney's office represents the state of North Carolina. That's all the citizens. It includes the law enforcement officers. It includes the general public. And as I mentioned before, our obligation is to do justice. It's not just to win cases. Our, our object and the object that, that our district attorney points out to us is that we are to do justice and to be fair to everyone. That's, that's what we try and do. Now, some people who are convicted may not like that, but those people are convicted by juries of folks just like you who are brought in off the street, 12 people, to judge whether or not someone's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Our job is to try and convince them, but if we don't, it's our job to walk away. It's our job not to prosecute a case and to push a case which we know is faulty either for a constitutional violation or a lack of evidence. We don't do that. This is the last question. What prevents an officer from abusing the probable cause clause? For instance, if an officer claims my car smells of marijuana and performs a search and the search results in nothing, they find nothing, have I been violated? If you've been smoking marijuana in your car within the last week or two, it's going to smell like marijuana, whether there's any there or not. If you were smoking at home and your clothes smell of marijuana, an officer is going to put their head in the window and they're going to smell marijuana. That's really the point that I was trying to make earlier. Smoke weed and that's the keys to the kingdom. It absolutely is. It's illegal but it's also an invitation for a search of your person and of your vehicle. Hello everyone again. Has everyone gotten a blue card yet? Roberta, the blue cards? <laughs> okay, they will be distributed to you shortly. They review everything that you've had tonight because we know you can't remember it all but that way you have a small card to take home with you about your rights when you're stopped by police or the law. We have a long way to come in this city, and this is one of the starts of the way of trying to work together and heal and do things. There are also some things like Ms. Linda said that we're working with her and the Department of Justice and some other groups trying to bring about positive change within this community, increasing community policing, increasing the fact that we will begin improving the trust level. So I thank all of you who came, but the room should have been filled to the rafters because that's what everyone's gonna complain about. So the next time you hear about something like this, you make sure your neighbor, your friend, or someone else comes. And when they say, where was the sheriff's department? Where was the police department? Where was the NAACP? We were here, but where were they? Thank you. In closing, I just want to make a remark that as police officers, we don't always get it right. So we didn't come here to do this presentation to tell you that we always get it right and the people on the other side always get it wrong. That is not the case. But the case is that when we suit up and we come to work, we put it on the line for the citizens of Wilmington everything we got, everything we love. We bring it to work and we put it on the line. We don't always get it right. So we did this presentation so that we can have a better relationship and encounter each other better when we do meet. 
So please know that we didn't come here tonight to say that we always get it right because we don't. We are human. Thank you. Deputy Chief Williamson. Deputy Chief Williamson, I just want to say before Deputy Chief Williamson gives our closing remarks, we're so glad that you came. If you would like to have this presentation brought to a school, a community group, uh, we won't use the whole group, but we will use representatives. We'll be more than glad to come to your churches, wherever. If you'd like to see us tweak it, add something, we're more than glad to try and do that. This was our opportunity. We did the Law and You probably about 15 years ago. Uh, we taught this program at Cape Fear Community College and in public housing. It was approved by the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Agencies, the NAACP, and Allstate Insurance Company. We decided to dust it off and bring it back into the community. So tonight, we decided instead of just letting law enforcement do it, to invite community people who wanted to be a part of it to have that opportunity, and we hope that you've learned something. If you received one of the brochures, there's contact information on the back. If you'd like to contact us, if there are questions that you did not get answers to, please feel free to email or call because we're always willing to help. Thank you very much. Here's Deputy Chief Williams. Uh, thank you for coming on behalf of Ralph Evangelist and uh, also to Sheriff. Uh, both could not be here tonight. We thank you for coming. Uh, to tell you that the men and women, men and women of the Wilmington Police Department and the Sheriff's Department uh, are united in our efforts to cause change uh, within our organizations and within our communities. Uh, thanks to our partners from the District Attorney's Office, the NAACP, the schools, uh, and anyone else I forgot, the Housing Authority, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cheatham, City Manager, coming tonight. Uh, Anytime you have questions or concerns, we are there to listen. So all you have to do is call. And I thank the men and women of, uh, of the, the police department and the sheriff's departments for their dedication. I guess I'm the old one in the room because I'm in my 35th year of law enforcement now, 32 of those here, three with another department. So uh, again, on behalf of both agencies and all agencies represented here tonight, thank you for coming. Thank you for your support. And if we can assist you in any way, let us know. Thank you. Good night.